couple announcements and then we'll do the commercials. So the announcement is this is the last class until July 21st. Now it's not because I don't want to have Bible study, but next week is LWML, so I've, you know, long ago when I took Thursday night, I, the rule was I could have Bible study except when it's LWML night so people didn't have to make a choice. So then after that, I'm in Alaska for two Thursdays. And then after that, I'm in Texas for, or on the way to Texas or in Texas for two Thursdays. And after that, we'll meet. <laughs> um, so National Youth Gathering is going on, but I, I am going to the National Youth Gathering sort of, except I'm just going to, uh, Denise and I, to watch two grandchildren who are going to the National Youth Gathering with their parents, and they don't have anybody to watch them, and they've got to give their attention to the kids that they're tending to. So our job will be to go to a, two blocks from the beach and, uh, and watch them for five days. Watch your feet. Yeah. Well, what, what's there? Watch your, no, watch your feet. You don't get another Oh, floor. yes, don't I need to. Don't bring home the souvenir you brought home last time. <laughs> An infection? Yeah. It's almost better though now, so I think by the time I go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it should be all better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'll, I'm going to be more careful, yes. Uh, um, so, uh, so July 21st, and it's advertised in the bulletin. Well, I, I think it is. I, I gave Chastity what to say. Um, but I think what we're going to do on, on Sunday morning, we were looking at Genesis 1, and people started asking a bunch of questions about dinosaurs. And, and so I said, well, we're going to have a dinosaur Bible study somewhere along the line. And just because people don't know that dinosaurs are found in the Bible, not that word, because that word is from 200 years ago or less than that. At the end of the study, did you all get to go to the ark together? Oh, that would be good. Yeah, because the, the ark actually has some great explanations of how dinosaurs fit together with uh, a biblical worldview. So it, it's very powerful. True. Yeah, that's what we, we need to. That would be fun. But we're going to do dinosaurs, and then I'm going to throw in some other weird stuff after that. We're going to look at ghosts and a little bit more on demon possession and all the quirky things that people have asked me questions about. So it'll be, but dinosaurs we'll spend a little bit of time on because it's kind of fun. And there's so many people who, you know, um, like Abby goes to school and they say dinosaurs lived, uh, what, 750,000 years before men, you know, and, and all that. And, and truth is, um, we have dinosaur footprints in the same uh, fossilized riverbed as human footprints. Um, they existed at the same time, like Genesis actually teaches us that. You know, and, and we, we, if you understand the flood and the ice age that followed the flood, you now know what happened to the dinosaurs, and you can explain dinosaur fossils. There's so much that kind of falls into place if you have a basic understanding of Scripture. So we're gonna, but so what dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible? That the one that its tail was like a pine. Yeah, we, I think we used to call it a brontosaurus, but it's called something different now. But I still want to call it a brontosaurus. But his tail was like a cedar tree, so powerful that you know if it hits you, you're dead. You know that type. And the, the other was a a. a, a sea-born dinosaur, uh, yeah. kind of like the Loch Ness Monster on steroids, as uh, would be how it's described. Um, and I love the one where that talks about in the, the, the footnotes for the NIV, and some of the people that wrote the footnotes um, were not exactly like you and me, um, strong believers that in the uh, inspired nature of Scripture. And so they said, when they, this tail is like a cedar tree, either an elephant or a hippopotamus. You know, and I love that footnote. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that elephant tail, that, may, that would knock me right over, you know. But so we got, we got a couple of those. And there's some other creatures that are called by a different name, but they were actually dinosaurs. Like in the King James Version, they use the word dragon. And they, oh, yeah, see, that's fantasy. Bible's all myth. Well, they, we didn't have the word dinosaur back then, so what was it? Dragons are dinosaurs, you know? Woo. And so, but it's in, just interesting how actual history and Bible give a totally different knowledge of dinosaurs than what evolution does. You could also bring in some show and tell. 
I could. What are where are you suggesting? You could bring in the mastodon. Yeah, we got woolly mammoth type uh, tusks and stuff. Not the whole, because we the one we uh, Daniel related to you um, helped me uh, weigh it for a guy, and um, I forget what it was, several hundred pounds, but it was like 14 feet long, uh, one that he found. You know, it's been fossilized, and it's like. Cool. Worth about ten thousand dollars, by the way. That's how he made his living: is finding fossils. <laughs> so uh, anyway, th so we're going to do some of that kind of fun stuff. So it, it'll be a, like a session to three sessions on a topic, and then we'll move on to the next one. And we'll just do that because in the summer months it's harder to be as consistent as we might like, and we can then pick a new serious, more serious Bible study. I'm still imagining the body that holds a probably two 14 foot tusks. Yes. Yeah, the size of that. Yeah. I mean, it was huge. Yeah. If I wouldn't oh, yeah, know yeah. with my own so eyes. So he gives us some of the smaller pieces. So I, I have in my office quite a few pieces um, of fossilized woolly mammoth or mastodon tusks. Um, but I don't have the huge ones because he's going to sell those. And that's how he would have never known that's what we were looking at. I would have thought it was bark or something. Yeah, it's very interesting stuff. So yeah, we'll, we can do that. All right, so that's just a little roadmap of where we're going this summer. We'll, we'll do kind of some fun, I think it's fun stuff, you know. Uh, so hopefully, maybe we'll get a few more people to come. Um, because the trips, I think, are interested in that. And Jerry and Rita were very fascinated by dinosaurs in the Bible, so. Yes, Mr. Bill is helping at the center. Um, all right, so that now here's that. That's the uh, class announcement. The other couple quick announcements. Um, uh, just uh, building bridges has been um, helping and helping and helping, and doing some marvelous things. Um, one of the things I've noticed is material costs continue to skyrocket. Right, Jackie. And um, their funds are starting to go down. So they're down to a couple thousand dollars, which is enough to do a next project or two. Um, but if you're ever thinking about an extra donation, building bridges would be a good time. And I'm going to be making this announcement not just in this class. So I'm not asking you to do anything big. But just, you know, a lot of times people say, well, I want to give something to, to make a difference. That would be a good one to make a difference in right now. Fundraiser yeah, we may have to do that again, but we want to do it in the fall, not yeah. in the summer. So, um, Also, uh, just our Alaskan mission team, our first Alaskan mission team made it back today. Um, so that's Arctic Village. That was, was it? So that was um, Pearl McKinney, um, Diane and Amy Holchin, and Jamie Holchin. So I think it was just four, um, but they had on the largest attendance day, they had 31 kids, probably close to 40 kids were involved in some way. Um, plus, kids that are outgrown that you know aren't going to come to VBS now, they've had really made a difference in the lives of a couple of them, it sounds like, just from the brief report. But we're excited about that. Next group that's for teen camp is leaving on Monday. Um, and we haven't been, so. Yeah, Denise and I are, um, it's been getting harder and harder for me to do two weeks on not great sleeping stuff and, all, you know. You would have been with grandchildren. And yeah, so we've kind of bowed out of the teen camp part now. Um, but uh, it's uh, first post-COVID one and it, it's uh, being set up a little different. We're keeping the numbers smaller yet to try and make sure that uh, we don't become a spreader, even though people aren't as scared about it. We still don't want to hurt uh, the reputation. But um, we've got, uh, it, I, I'm fascinated because the three people in charge of teen camp really are three younger members of our church, um, Rebecca Drum, Amy Holchin, and Heather um, Bassett. Um, and all of them have been helping with teen camp for m at least five years, probably all of them. And so, and they do such a good job. It's so neat to see, uh, you know, faith in young people and they're eager to share. Amy's staying up there for a while, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, so she's up there for about a, almost a month. Yeah, but uh, so that's coming up. And then we have, um, we have two teams that are gonna be out the, right after teen camp um, at the same time. So the Deering group, that's Denise and I and Dana and uh, Rebecca and Andrea Ignaziak, that's our first time going. Yeah, I said Amy. Yeah, 
and then, uh, yeah, I don't know if I did, actually, so thank you. Um, and then uh, we also have Beanatai, which is primarily Brunner family, you can think of. Uh, and Heather's going to that one? All right, yeah, so that's good. But we'll just, we're going to be keeping them in our Sunday morning prayers. So I wouldn't mind if you guys prayed for them, too. And the last thing, um, I was just amazed. We got here early so Denise could unlock the sharing center for the people who were going to help. Um, and there were already people half hour early here to, to, because they needed stuff. And I don't know how many cars, but when I was there, there was at least five different cars that uh, were there, probably more than that. But um, it's just neat to see how many people. Uh, we delivered uh, yesterday to a, a nice lady. Her apartment was empty. She had stuff, but no furniture. So uh, uh, we had, yeah. It was third floor, but at least it wasn't five floors up. <laughs> well, it wouldn't matter when I carried that chair and you had her call you anyway. Yeah, yeah, Denise, you called just at the right time. He said, did you call her and tell her to call you right back? And I said, no, I texted her. <laughs> <laughs> I know how things to get out of work. <laughs> yeah, my son Chance was going to meet us there, and he did. But he got there. I said, we're leaving this last one. <laughs> the, the biggest one we made him help carry. I, I helped him out. Just a little, I hope. I don't, the, no, no. <laughs> but um, the, the apartment was empty. You know, there was no furniture. And so she was here again tonight and uh, got picked out some more things. That, explain her story, but she, she works for Lowe's Foods. Yeah, so she's the one that uh, said, you know, would you take food that just expired? You know, because they can't sell it at the stores. And I said, absolutely. So I got her a letterhead. But she's, you know, it's funny how often when people are helped, then they try to do stuff to help. You know, because we had, we had people that I delivered stuff to in that same apartment complex that then said, you know, I have some stuff I could give you. And so then I ended up taking stuff back too. And then the people that we helped a couple of weeks ago uh, have already started hauling stuff for us, uh, you know, because they, they were just amazed and they, we didn't want money, we didn't ask for anything, and they said, well, could we help you do this? And we said, sure, you know, and he has his own trailer. God's providing, because that's our biggest need is someone other than Jackie and Doug <laughs> to deliver furniture. Michael would say, and Michael. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Michael Tripp, yeah. Yeah, we, we get Michael a lot if we can pick him up later in the day. Yeah, Briar Holden, me, <laughs> and mainly I supervise. I'm really good at supervising. Yeah, now put it in this truck here. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. What was that? With a oh yeah. Jackie. Yeah, yeah. Yesterday we were helping my daughter and son-in-law load their stuff into a big uh, semi-type truck or something, and so. Um, uh, Pastor Paul Nielsen and I are, have a. A unique relationship. It's kind of like Jackie and I, my relationship, because he picks on me pretty good, and I pick on him pretty good. Jackie, you could do a little better on picking on me, by the way. It's okay. I'm glad I'm still first. Yeah, <laughs> you are. You're you're at the top, but um, he. <laughs> yeah. So um, they were taking some furniture out, and I'd say, big step, big step, big step, little step, little step, and I just you know I'd describe so. Uh, he said, this is almost like a, a television commentator. You know? <laughs> and so then when I was coming out, he just started doing the same thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, we have fun. Yeah, it, it is a lot of fun when you're working on this stuff, isn't it, Jackie? It's very rewarding. Totally, and I mean that. When, when the people are so thankful and, you know, because the, the little boy that we delivered the gaming chair for, you know, um, I think you, did you carry that up or who carried that up? It wasn't me. It must have been Doug. Because I didn't. Well, I didn't carry it up. I had, I had the big chair. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I wasn't going to carry that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he came up and said, I wanted to tell you thank you. You know, I thought, this is a little kid, you know, probably. I don't know how old, but I mean, that made me feel good. But he had nothing in his room except his pile of stuff. That's a good family to help. Yeah. All right, so let, let's pray and get busy. All right, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word. Uh, we pray that you will open up our hearts and minds to your Holy Spirit so that we can hear and understand and then remember and even live out. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. 
All right, so turn to Luke 22. So this is our final day on miracles. So I took some of the last three or four miracles in the life of Jesus. Um, and we won't, yeah, we probably won't get through all of them because they took too long talking. But um, we're, we're going to talk about the one that I hinted. You know, I do news teases on the radio each morning. I, I hint at what's coming up so that you will listen in at the next hour, you know. So um, we'll tell you how you can get fame and fortune. News at 11. You know, <laughs> you know that, but um, so I always do teasers on Facebook about what we're talking about tonight. And we're talking about impulsive actions. So, so when I say that, what am I talking about? Impulsive actions. You just react to the situation. Yeah, so if someone irritates you and you react impulsively, what might happen? Either you say something bad or you hit them. Yeah, it's almost always the natural impulse is from what nature? Sinful or new nature? What would you say? Sinful. It's just about always sinful nature. Because, you know, when, when you fall and hurt yourself, the word that comes out, sinful nature or new nature? Mostly sinful. And, and I know some people that are really good. And, you know, and they say, Lordy mighty, that hurts. You know, and it's like, wow, what, what a sanctified, beautiful person. <laughs> Sometimes I say, shoot. It starts to come out, and then I change it. <laughs> I try to catch it because, you know, when a pastor curses, somebody always hears it, and the whole church will know it. So I try not to do that. Uh, but always hears you. Yes, and that's even more important. But the, the impulsive action, we, we need that sanctified pause. And, and by that, I just mean, Take a breath and think about what does God want me to do? Because that impulsive action almost always ends up bad for me, bad for the kingdom of God. And so we're looking at an impulsive action today. So look at uh, Luke 22, starting at verse 47. This is a very famous miracle of Jesus. Um, so it's not, but I wanted to use this kind of as a, as a general discussion then. So uh, Luke twenty two forty seven, 47. Um, all right. So while he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. So this is in where? Garden, Garden of Gethsemane, um, night before Jesus is crucified, just after the Last Supper. Uh, they had gone to a place to pray. It was late in the evening. It was dark. Um, so they were going to bring torches. By the way, is it easy to identify a particular Jewish man in the dark? Um, because what did they ha look like? They all had brown hair, long hair, beards, you know. Skin. Yeah, and olive color skin. Long enough that they could roll up. Skin. Yeah, they would always, I mean, but they all, I mean, I, this sounds prejudicial, but they all look alike pretty much, you know. Back then they did because, you know, um, if you look at the gentleman in this room, um, lots of facial hair, a little facial hair, no facial hair. So if, if you see the three of us, you would know, all right, I, I saw long whiskers, especially white hair shows up well. You know, you would know me in the, even in the semi-dark. But then they would just all look alike. So Judas had to not just tell them where Jesus was going to be. He had to show them Jesus because the soldiers aren't going to know him at night. So, um, so he, he was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. And, you know, isn't that interesting? Why was he going to kiss him? On the cheek. You know. That was how he was going to deal with it. Yeah, that was his signal to the soldiers. This is the guy you want to arrest. Um, a sign of friendship and love being used to betray. Um, yeah, not good, not good. Uh, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Now, there's other places in it that talk about this. Um, what, what is another term that Jesus used on that garden to, when he's talking to Judas? He called him friend. He still called him friend. Yeah, I mean, it's just interesting. He knew all along what Judas was going to do, and he knew what the result would be. He knew the torture and the cross and, and, and death, but he still cared about him. 
Um, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? What's the significance of that three-word title, Son of Man? In, in your Bible, it should be capitalized. Um, yeah, it's, it's a nickname for the Messiah, the promised one of the Old Testament. So Jesus is publicly identifying himself as who he is here, too. Um, he, both Son of Man and Son of God were Old Testament references to the coming Messiah. Both fit when you think about it. When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Now they asked, didn't they? See, now that's the right way. Pause, consult with Jesus, you know, then act. Um, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. Now Luke doesn't tell you who it is. It was Peter. So why didn't Luke tell us? Snitches get stitches. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure this is a stitches get a snitches get stitches case. I think Luke was protecting Peter's reputation. Oh. Because he's, this is being written to the Gentiles. The Jewish people, like Matthew's written, written primarily to Jewish people, Jewish people already knew, you know, Peter, what Peter was like, and he was the one who did that. Gentiles wouldn't know the whole story, and Luke doesn't identify him. You know, he's, kind of, he's protecting. And, of course, Peter was restored, forgiven, you know, his call renewed. So he's making sure that people would still respect Peter as a leader in the Christian church. But I, I just found that interesting. Um, so he responds impulsively. The others ask, Lord, should we defend you? And he reaches in. Uh, and you think of the robes they wore? You can hide a sword inside that robe real easily. You know, no one's going to really know it, but you slip your hand in, you're ready. And so he cuts off the servant of the high priest. Now, that's he, the servant of the high priest was not one of the soldiers. I found that ironic, too. So why was the servant of the high priest with the soldiers and with Judas? Because the high priest wanted him dead. He wanted the high priest. He was going to tell the high priest that, what it, that Jesus was arrested or whatever happened. He was there to be able to report back to the high priest. But, <laughs> you know, Peter was impulsive, but he is also relatively safe because the servant's not going to cut him into pieces with his own sword. <laughs> and maybe he was the closest, but I'm just thinking, if, if you really want to stop them, maybe you take on a, one of the Roman soldiers, but I, I, just kind of interesting stuff. I'm assuming the servant was the closest one to where Peter was, so that's where you'd start. Um, but he cut off his right ear. So he didn't just cut the right ear. He cut off the right ear. It falls to the ground, I'm assuming. Um, so Jesus answered. So this is answering the original question. No more of this. And so here it's an abbreviated form. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. So what do you think he did there? Picked up the ear. I think he picked up the ear. Held it up there when he took his hand away, it was attached. What does it say in the other books? Yeah, let's let's just look because this is found. All right, I'm going to get two volunteers. This is found in Matthew, Mark, and, and John also. So I'm going to get because I'll look up one. All right, who wants to look up Matthew 26? All right, Denise has got that one. Yeah. Okay, um, you volunteered, so you got um, Mark 14. It's starting at verse 43. And I'm going to look up John 18. I glanced at these, but I did not uh, memorize them. So it's always interesting to compare and contrast. So um, in, in John 18, here's what it says about this ear-cutting incident. Um, John 18, verse 19. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Now, there's the extra detail. Let's see, because uh, oh, no, Luke does not tell us which ear it was, does he? Oh, it does say right ear. Yeah, it says right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. By the way, historic references, not the same as scripture, mind you, so 
get, you can take or leave this. Um, report that Melchus became a believer in Jesus. I would too if my ear got cut off and then <laughs> healed. I mean, I think I would believe in him too, but I don't know for sure that happened, but it's a likely thing. Okay, so that was the key part. Yeah, and then Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Very interesting. All right, Mary, you want to go next? Yeah. Just anything about Peter cutting off the ear is what we're looking at. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Would I'm going to ask you something. Yeah, would he, The one that the ear got cut off, would Peter not have known him as being Caiaphas's? Possibly, but again, remember, this is dark, and so they would have had a, a, a torch or two. But if you think of what a, a, the light a torch gives is not consistent light, so I'm not sure he knew who he was hitting. Yeah, the Roman soldiers would have had some sort of uniform on that was... Should, should have known the difference between the two, but I think adrenaline's flowing, you attack who's ever closest to you. But I, I, it, or it may be... He's being bold, but careful. <laughs> I don't know. That, those are my two explanations. All right, Denise? Well, the long and short of this one is there's a lot of detail, but it doesn't even talk about how Jesus fixed the ear. All right, so what does it say? Because we're just comparing here. So it's Jesus replied, friend, do what you came for. And then um, they arrested Jesus with one of Jesus' companions, reached out for his sword, drew it, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who are drawn the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, I am leading a rebellion that you Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Yeah, now we're coming to that last part. It was still will come up in Luke. I, just, I thought it was interesting. It yeah, this, even. So Matthew, yours was Matthew, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, Matthew didn't even report about the healing part with the miracle part, which is fascinating. Now, notice... Here, he just said no more of this. In the John account, he said, shall I not drink the cup? Did, you know, in there was a more detailed explanation of why I this. Yeah, I, I could stop this anytime I wanted to. You don't need to do this. And which of those three things did he say? All of them. All of them. And each one remembers parts of what he said and reports it. But all of them are accurate. And if you think about it, if you fit those three together, um, Luke is giving the initial, no more of this. You know, he who lives by the sword will die by the sword comes from Matthew. And, you know, and then we have, shall I not drink this cup, which goes with what Matthew said. Um, but notice his, what he's trying to get them to understand the arrest of Jesus in the garden, the torture of Jesus on that night in Good Friday, the crucifixion of Jesus, the death of Jesus, that's why he came on earth. That's, that's the whole point of, of Christmas. That's the whole point of why he took on human flesh. He came so that this stuff would happen, so that scripture could be fulfilled, so that sin could be paid for, so that you and I and everyone who believes would have the opportunity to have our sins forgiven and, and have eternal life in heaven. So he's He's causing this to happen. You know, he comes to Jerusalem um, on purpose. He stirs up the high priest by healing Lazarus of death right outside the city. And then he does other miracles right outside the city. And it's like, now we have to deal with him because before it was out there, they didn't have to. Now he's on their doorstep. He's, he, you know, he goes to the city where he knows this is about to happen. He causes it to happen, in effect. And, you know, remember before when Jesus was talking about um, he was going to be arrested and put to death and on the third day rise again, and Peter said, no, Lord, let this never happen. You know, get behind me, Satan. Peter was responding impulsively there, too. He done it like I would do it. He loves Jesus. He wants to protect him. Yeah. There's absolutely nothing wrong with his impulses. 
except. From an immature faith, he didn't understand. He didn't understand, and he's not filtering them through his Savior. Because the other stopped and said, should we fight for you? Peter didn't run it through Jesus. And my big weaknesses is that sometimes I respond immediately to whatever circumstances without filtering it through faith, without filtering it through Christ, without filtering it through God's word. And when I respond immediately, most of the time my impulses are horrible. You know, so if that person cuts you off on the road, what's the immediate impulse? Shoot. No, no, it's not shoot. Yeah, I hope not, no. <laughs> but I mean, sometimes we... Yeah, sometimes we're saying words. If your windows are up, it's okay, but we're not even supposed to call people you fool. See, I usually like to say things like, go ahead, cut in front of me. I really don't care, but it's such sarcasm that, you know, it's drippy. Yeah, and, but I'm just thinking of people. So I was irritated. I irritated a guy. You know how when there's a construction zone and they say right lane closed ahead and everybody goes over to the left lane except... 5,000 cars. They keep going. So then eventually I start edging out so that they have to go way around and then usually some other cars do too because we're kind of getting annoyed. Well this one car got annoyed because I blocked him. And so then um, he, he at the last second he got right in front of me and then what he did is he went like all the other cars were going 25 miles an hour through the construction zone. He went two miles an hour, intentionally slow, so that I would have to be slowed down too. And I thought, well, <laughs> you know. But that's the human instinct, isn't it? And the, the, the one finger wave is not an act of friendship, you know. The, uh, so there's a lot of things we can do. That immediate impulse is not necessarily the best one. And we want to take our ideas of what's the proper reaction to Christ and let him and especially his word shape us. If you think of the person who's like speeding crazily and I'm not talking about just speeding but like whipping in and out of, of people my first instinct when I saw that person was um, I hope you get pulled over but yeah. then, into my, I have to believe it was the Holy Spirit came, please don't let this guy die for driving like this. Well, you remember that one time we were in South Carolina, almost uh, up to Charlotte area on, uh, on 77, and the uh, car was you know, in and out, changing lanes, getting by everybody. And, and I'm going to confess, this is on video, so I have to be honest. I go like five miles over the speed limit a lot of times. You know? And part of that is for safety, because if you don't match speeds, you kind of you know, are a target. Um, but part of that's because I'm sinful, and it seems like I can excuse. Well, my, I'm not sure my, my speedometer's all that accurate. It might be off by about five miles an hour give or take, so I, I think I'm okay. You know, you know how we excuse away what I do. Now, if Jackie did that, I'd, you know, I'd be preaching against him on Sunday, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so... We have more arguments about the driving part than anything. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid to comment too much because I love both of you. <laughs> you'll get it right back from yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad it ain't just us. Yeah, because no, Denise no. might, if I said anything, she's going to say, you hypocrite. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she could. So, um, but, and, and, and I was just amazed because, so, what is the speed limit there? 65 miles an hour or 70 miles an hour, whatever it is, you know. And um, I estimate he was going 95 miles an hour because, I mean, he was passing the people that were passing me, you know. And about, I don't know, maybe a quarter mile in front of us, we saw him do another one of those passes, and he clipped the corner of a car. 
Um, his car ended up going off the road and got airborne and went over the fence. And I, you know, we were past in no time at all, so I didn't really see how bad, but that scared me. And what scared me even worse was the car that he clipped, because they got spun all around and, and everything, and I thought, you know, when people pass me like that, I need to be praying God keep them safe in spite of themselves. Because, you know, every so often, have you ever, like, started to change lanes and then finally look? And it's, ah, oh, there's a car there. I almost ran it, you know, ooh, adrenaline flows. And it's like my prayer a lot of times when, I, when I'm driving is, God, protect me from myself. Because it's not, you know, I'm, I'm the my biggest. Beats at me now. Yeah, well, that's nice. That, yeah, isn't that nice? Lately, when, lately, my prayer's been, Lord, protect me. Yeah, just well, period. after you just got crashed into there, yeah. So, but this immediate reaction is not always the best reaction. In fact, 90% of the time, it's not the best reaction. Now, um, there can be times an immediate reaction may be necessary. Like so, the child's running out in the yeah, street. Yeah, the child's running in the street. You do what you, you know, adrenaline flows, you do what you have to. If the house is on fire, I don't want you to pause for a long time and think about things. What would Jesus do? Jesus would grab your kids and get out of the house. Uh, you know, whatever you have to do. But I, there's most of the time, our reaction needs to be measured by faith. Is this the response Christ would have me do? Remember the old uh, WWJD, what would Jesus do bracelets and stuff? And that's not a bad question to, to ask. Um, I've got a family story on that. Go, go for it. I like stories. Back when that was popular, J Jana and Josie, my nieces, there's three or four years difference. And M Melanie was going, all right, girls, what would Jesus do? And the little one looked up at her big sister and said, you be Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's good. I like that. It's your yeah. turn, you be Jesus. Yeah. I don't right. wanna... She's going to get whatever they were fighting. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, go back to the text, because I want to do at least one more miracle after this. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, and notice that we had all that, the temple guard, off of the, you know, the chief priests, the elders. This is a huge group, a huge group. Um, Am I leading a rebellion that you've come with swords and clubs every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me, uh, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. And, and Denise shared actually more words that he said too. Um, now, why didn't they arrest him in the temple court? They didn't have, I mean, they didn't, would have known who he was real easy because everybody knew who Jesus was there. Uprising of the people. Who yeah, loved he, people loved him. And you remember the crowd, 10 to 15 to 20,000 people? That's the reality every day around Jesus. Crowds were thick. And how big of, uh, how many people lived in Jerusalem back then? Estimate. All depends on Passover, it was overflowing. Yeah, but I mean, Jerusalem was a major city. So, Abby, do you have a cell phone with you? Would you look up um, population of Jerusalem at Jesus' time? Because my inclination is it's over 100,000 people, and I th it could be much over, you know, quite a bit over, but I'm, I don't know that I'm right or if I'm remembering things jabbered up. So, um, but, so the, you know, they couldn't risk. Yes, you already got it. Man, you're, well, I was in the ballpark. Woohoo! Go me. <laughs> it's not often I remember correctly. But, you know, you think of it, 100,000 people, um, what is Hickory now? 40,000, 50,000, something like that? 100,000, <laughs> yeah. Abby, I'm going to keep you busy. <laughs> I, I don't even know. But uh, my hometown would be less than 100,000 people. You know, but just think, if you got, you know, so that's, yes. 41,000. All right, so... Jerusalem would have been double plus, tw two, and, two and a half times. So, you, you know, and, but they couldn't risk that because 80% of the people, I guarantee you, love Jesus. Yeah, or had their relative cured, or sat and listened to his teaching. They all thought high things of Jesus, even if they didn't understand that he was the Son of God. They had a very positive impression. So they couldn't do it because the people rebel, the priests, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the religious leaders lose their power. And, and for them, life was about power. I mean, they weren't really interested in upholding scripture. 
What they cared about is their own power and influence. So they just couldn't do it. But here Jesus points out, you know, yeah, when you come in the hour of darkness, this is your hour. Meaning, who are they working for? Satan. And that was truth. So, all right, what's the significance of the miracle here? So he heals the guy's ear. That's, this would have been, well, I mean, the resurrection would be another miracle. And then we got the, the feeding after, after the, the resurrection. So there's a lot of other miracles. But this would have been like the last. Helping his enemies. Yeah, one, he's helping someone who's not a believer. So he's also showing that he has power, that we don't have to take care of the things, but he can actually take care of them. Yeah. That, that he could have, at any time, taken care he of could have, He could have stopped them but he loved like that. So much that. So, and there is part of that. So I act on impulse sometimes because I want to make things under my control. I don't like the situation. I got to do something to make it better, right? Am I the only one who's? I mean, that's that's why I do stuff sometimes. So, and that's being very honest and open with you. So, um, I can't change everything. So, if I can change one thing, see, I'm making it better. It's my own little contribution towards sanity, towards me being able to fall asleep at night. So, what do I learn here? Jesus has it all under control, even when I think it's not under control. Even when things seem to be falling apart, he is totally in control. And he reminds him, hey, no, this is me. I got this. This is the plan. You know, my, pl my ways are not your ways. That's what he said the last time, you know, Peter tried to stop the cross from even being talked about. You know, so there's something here that Jesus calms the troubled heart, if you just remember, he can call down 12 legions of angels anytime he wants today, too. He can stop anything evil that doesn't fit into his plan. And if he's going to allow it, why am I rebelling against it? You know what I'm saying? It's exhausting to try as a recovering control freak. It's exhausting to try, I'm saying this in quotes, to be in control of it, to be Jesus or whatever, and to remind yourself, even just in the words, it must be exhausting to have to be Jesus. Yeah. Because that's really what Peter was trying to do, was take control of the situation. He's, he's trying to make things be the way he wanted. And sometimes we have to just understand that things are going to be the way God wants and let that happen. Now, I will tell you the first, very hard for me, for first four or five years I was a pastor, that was before I came here, I never missed a meeting at church. I mean, if there was a meeting at church, I was going to be there. Why? Because I had to make sure that things went right. I had to make sure that my plans were carried out. That's what I mean by right. You know? And because if I'm not there, then what if they make a decision that isn't what I want? You know, whoa, the world would be over if Pastor Johnson's decisions are not followed every single stinking time. And I'm saying this facetiously, but yeah, I was thinking I was Jesus, was, didn't I? And there was some time where I finally realized, well, you know what? God can work through the elders even if I'm not present at an elders meeting. So by the time I came here, Hey, if I'm going to go on vacation, I'm going on vacation. I'm not going to ask you to reschedule the meeting. You can have it or not. I don't care, but I'm, I'm not going to be there. That's the main thing I need you to know. Because God's bigger than me, and most of the time I don't really understand his plan anyway. In fact, I'm always surprised. You know, I think St. John's is really a wonderful congregation, and, and I mean that. Um, and sometimes people come up, well, you know, you've really changed things. And I said, I didn't, this, <laughs> You know, maybe I had some slight influence here or there, but most everything that makes St. John's wonderful has nothing to do with anything I did at all. Probably Doug Travis has <laughs> made things more wonderful than any other human being. But then you can start going with 4,000 other people that have made St. John's wonderful. Because Hi. What's that? Fire. I think about how Whoa, all the people all that, us. you know, in fact, even the people outside the church that came to, to make St. John's 
to help St. John's recover, and they did all kinds of stuff, you know. And it opened St. John's eyes to other churches that suffered the same thing, and it just... Yeah, the one, one pastor from a church that had gotten burned down in Iowa sent me a few books. He said when, when my church burned down, I got people, pastors started sending him books to replace his library that got burned up, and he said, I thought I'd start replacing yours. These are some of the extra ones I got. And, you know, I didn't have any books, so, phew, boy, that was nice. But it's like, yeah, then you start being aware of other churches that go, unfortunately, church fires are not that rare, you know. They're, Bethlehem. Yes. A Baptist church, I think. Or, and, yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is good. And I'll guarantee it has a sprinkler system just like we do. But I mean, I think when you think about it, when we left this congregation old church here and had to move to the gym, nobody had a pew. And that first <laughs> service, it was like, okay, where do, where I, do I sit? Where do I sit? I mean, that is you know, the struggle. And we were like mixed up. Because everybody like knew about where they never, sit. Sylvia, yeah, I know where you sit. I know where you, by the way, pretty close to each other. Yeah, I know where you sit, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> yes, I do, thing about it was we were sitting by people that we maybe had never sat by before. Yes. But I bet it was still on the right side or the left side. <laughs> yeah, somewhat, although, you know, it was curved, so they weren't straight. And then we kept trying to set up the chairs differently so we could get more people in. Because you remember, we were having like 300 people on there. We had balconies. In yeah, balconies. I mean, we had we had 50 people sitting in the kitchen, literally. We'd have 20 people sitting in the, Chair, the closets. Uh, yeah. You know, we had Sunday school classes in the attic, which was really was not safe. Well, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, you know, we called that the balcony. Yeah, we, they were all the balcony. Yeah. I was. I was but, fun. yeah, God was in control even of that. And I'm thinking it's a disaster how we're going to make things happen. And, you know, St. John's grew during that time. We probably grew, gained 150 members during that two and a half years we were on folding chairs in the gym. You know, God had a plan. It was a good plan. I, at first, I wasn't fully appreciating his plan, you know, have trouble seeing. And, and it's easy to get depressed, anxious, sad. Sad is okay, by the way, but not, faith is the appropriate response always. But, but I just wanted you to see, isn't this amazing? Peter acts impulsively, but Jesus makes the plan work out, and he undoes what Peter did. He fixes it. And you said there was some documentation that that servant yeah. came the, to faith that Yes, historical sources. Now, most of this is like from 150, 200 years after the fact. So you don't know if it's true or not. But if you see it in a couple of places, you tend to think it probably really happened. But, you know, um, so I don't ever count on it, but I like the stories. You know, like um, uh, Simon of Cyrene. You know, we know from outside scripture sources that his sons became leaders in the Christian church. And I'm, the fact that his sons are mentioned by name in the scripture, even though it doesn't list them as leaders of the church, but the fact that they were names were listed, to me, is backup of the fact that, yeah, that really happened. So sometimes you, you're adding a little bit to scripture. But, you know, the, the Roman centurion who saw everything that happened when Jesus was crucified, I don't see how he couldn't have come to faith. You know, he sees the three hours of darkness. You know, he, he fills the earthquake. And then just as Jesus breathes his last, the sun starts shining again. And it's like, you know, um, I'm thinking I would get it. <laughs> well, and he did say that must be the Messiah. Surely this must be the Son of God. And, and, and that could have just been an expression, but I think it was a confession of faith. So, yeah. But, but it is fun to think about those people who were eyewitnesses of portions of the resurrection and how did that impact them the scripture doesn't always tell us but i have fun thinking about that you know i do all right so we're going to quickly look at one other one so let's look at yeah 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 um let's look at matthew 21 matthew 21 it's short so that will be a good one because we only got technically seven minutes is that what you got so we got to end on time. <laughs> you, you know what it means when a pastor says in a sermon, and now in conclusion, what does that mean? 
It means nothing. You don't know. You still can talk forever. Because <laughs> I've had pastors say that, and it's like, it, come on. <laughs> um, so Matthew 21, uh, starting at verse 18. This is, this is just an interesting one, kind of quirky. It's a, a unique miracle. Early in the morning, as he was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. This is Jesus, by the way. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. So why did he do that? Because there wasn't any fruit. But now he knew all along there wouldn't be any fruit on it. Took over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somehow I don't think that was it. But, but so I want you to think about this. Why did he do it? By the way, um, yeah, look, we're going to read the rest of this, and then I'm going to read you something from um, Mark that looks at the same incident. Um, when the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. So I have vines that grow up my trees, and once a year I go out and cut them off. I leave them attached to the tree, but you know they're now not getting any nourishment. So over a month, they will slowly wither, but they don't wither right away. You know, for, in fact, a, a week or two after, I'm thinking, why didn't I cut those? I must have left some of them attached because they're still green. But then now they start, you know, coming. So, you know, a lot of times, you, even if it's killed, you, the leaves take weeks to wither, or at least days. Um, and so they asked, how did it happen so quickly? And Jesus replied, to tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Now, why did he do that? Why did he do that to the fig tree? Can set an example for them. Yeah, you see, he's showing them something about the power of prayer, isn't he? So this is a teaching tool. This is a children's sermon. Because children's sermon, you always want to have something they can relate to, something they can see or touch or something like that. This is so they have something concrete to think about when he makes that statement about prayer. Now, I'm just going to read. Um, this is Mark 11, which is about the same thing, but after the fact. So um, Mark 11, starting at verse 20. Oh, I'm on Mark 10. That's why it didn't look right. All right, here we go. Uh, in the morning, as they went out, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you had cursed has withered. So the next morning, it's even more so. You know, and Peter's surprised, although it had, the leaves had withered already at the time. In, but I'm just share what, have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, and anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. So in both cases, he was using the fig tree to tie into the prayer. So what, what's, what's the point? And we went really fast, and I, and I apologize for that. But what was the point he's trying to make about prayer? So we got a visual demonstration of his power, but he's saying, you have that power too, in effect, right? Because through prayer, you can do even greater things than that. Yeah, I can do all things through him, not on my own. But um, so part of this is confidence in prayer. Um, now notice, because in, in the Matthew account, it just talks about the power of prayer. But in the Mark account, it also talks about if you believe and do not doubt. So, you know, the old story is about, you know, it's, uh, it's a drought and they come together to have a prayer service and pray for rain. And the pastor, first thing he says is, how many of you brought an umbrella? You know, and the answer was no one. You know, and don't you expect God to answer? And you know what? When we pray, a lot of times we don't really expect God to answer. And that, I think that's truth. 
You know, so when someone has cancer, and we pray, God, take this cancer away, what do we really think is going to happen? See them in heaven. Yeah. And, and I think that's partially fear, though. Because, like, my defense mechanism is to not get my hopes up because then they can't be crushed. And, and that's not the right way to look at God. So when you, when you pray for someone to be healed of cancer, God has three options of how he can answer that prayer positively. What are they? All of them are answering the prayer of healing. Yes on earth, yes in heaven, or... Yes through doctor's medicine, chemo, yes. surgery, whatever, radiation, whatever. You know, that's one way, God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's instantly. Um, and I, I am here to tell you as a pastor that if, uh, I've prayed with people and there have been some miraculous times where cancer disappeared and they have no explanation whatsoever. Most of the time, if cancer disappears, it's because God uses that Dr. Orlowski. Is that his name, the cancer doctor in this area? Yeah. Orlowski. I said it almost right. That's pretty good. You know, or he, he uses that new experimental cancer treatment or, you know, immunotherapy or whatever. He uses earthly means, which is how God mainly works. Because remember, um, Timothy had stomach pro or Yeah, um, Paul was uh, telling Timothy what to do for his stomach problems. He said, drink a little wine with your meal, and that'll help with your stomach problems, which, you know, nowadays we recognize that a little bit of wine can have health benefits. Well, that's what they did back then. And, you know, when they said apply oil, um, that was not just... Um, you know, a faith thing that was medical treatment at the time. It was very much how they, tr you know, so the answer wasn't prayer alone, it's prayer and medical treatment. And, you know, uh, so we have that. That's one way he answers. Sometimes it is totally miraculous, unexpected. And, and I love it when doctors say, you know, I've seen this before where I don't have any explanation except that it's a God thing. You know, and I love it when a doctor says that, by the way, because because, I mean, I had an aunt who had uh, cancer in, uh, bone cancer in her leg. They are going to amputate her leg to make sure they got it. Or just before they did the, she was, came in for her surgery, they wanted to take one more scan of her leg to make sure that they were cutting far enough up to get all the cancer. And when they did the last scan, they couldn't find any cancer. So then they repeated the test. She, she went home without having surgery. Kept her legs and never did get a leg cut off. And so what was their explanation? Spontaneous healing, okay, <laughs> you know, I call that a God thing, uh, you know, that's how, so that's God answering prayer, but um, can I pick on you, young lady in the back? Or I could pick on the young lady almost in the back, because both of you have had breast cancer, and both of you do not have breast cancer right now, am I correct? All right, and God used doctors and medicine and surgeries and I don't know what all but you know all of those things and that's that's a beautiful way God healed in during that process it's a process of faith because the whole time you're still praying and yet when you hear uh, by the way Lewis Holler woo, I think I can share this he's in remission so you know we've been praying for him so whew, I, well if I wasn't supposed to Sorry, but I'm still celebrating, and it's okay. Um, but he told me, so once you tell the pastor, I figure it's common knowledge. It is now, anyway. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's still a God thing. But, but to me, so um, when I went off to college, I, I knew two people on this campus, and my uncle and aunt lived in the same town, but, you know, I wasn't going to be hanging out with them. So I was 40,000 people in the University of Wisconsin. I knew two people. I was tremendously lonely. And so I prayed, God, I need Christian friends. And, and I was asking specifically for Christian friends. Well, the next day, a guy knocks on my door, and he introduces himself, and he invites me to, they have a small church, an uh, undenominational church that was meeting in the basement of the building that I was in on Sunday morning. And he said, would you like to come over and have supper with us? Christian invites me to supper right after I pray, God, give me Christian friends. I thought, I better say yes. <laughs> you know, but that was, it's like, whoa, you don't have because you don't ask. I finally asked instead of just being homesick, and God answered. 
you know, to believe in the power of prayer and to look for God to answer. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to answer every time just the way I want. But when we pray, believe he's going to answer in the way that is best for me and for his kingdom. So, but he wants us to obviously believe in prayer. So he withers a tree. Is that a big, horrible thing? No. It was a great teaching tool, though. <laughs> Yeah, it was, a, it was a worthless tree anyway because it wasn't bearing fruit, and it wasn't a baby tree. It was a tree that should have been bearing fruit. By the way, we could make an analogy. Christians are meant to bear fruit. You know, God has a list of good works he's prepared for us to do. Um, it's not that he's going to wither us, by the way. I'm not using that. But the idea that we are meant to accomplish his plan, just like that fig tree. And when we actually do it, we benefit far better than anyone around. When you see what God can do through you, it's overwhelming. You know, it's like, God, you are really awesome. You know, because, it, and it is, you know. Uh, the, the sharing center stuff, uh, probably four or five days out of the week, I either deliver furniture or pick up furniture or just help over at the sharing center. And I've had more contact with non-church members than I've had in a long time. That's a blessing for me because I see God using our church. And it just feels so cool to me to see God's using little old us. And we're making a difference in Alaska. And, and we make a difference where we send out church workers. Because if you want to take credit, you should. My son David is a church worker in California because of you guys. Most pastors' kids don't go into church work anymore. Why? What they saw turned them off to church work. My kids saw church work as a positive thing. Why? Because you guys were a loving church family, and you made them think that church workers are appreciated and loved and valued. You know, you guys are making a difference in California and Taiwan, well, in, formerly in Taiwan and Thailand and China, because you made it people feel safe about going out and serving the Lord. You know, that's a cool thing. But God uses. We're not even the big city church. That's Concordia. We're not the big, big city church, you know, St. Stephen. We're the country church, the blue-collar church, the, you know, you know, none of the important people go to this church. Well, not in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, who's the apostles? There was one that was worthwhile, Judas. All the rest were nobodies, <laughs> the blue-collar people. And he uses them to turn the whole world upside down, literally. That's what I see God doing. And to me, the sharing center has reminded that, that God's using little old us to do some cool, cool things. And, and it's exciting. You know? All right, any other thoughts or comments? Because I'm now six minutes past when I said I went in. And I apologize sincerely to all of you, especially to Abby. She's still young and has bedtimes. Or don't you? No, no, okay. Remember, Abby's at that point where when we, we were... We would try to go to bed, and my kids would say, you can't go to bed yet, it's too early. Well, I can if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, are you old? Yeah, that's what Mary would say to me. And then we'd say yes. <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, leave me alone. I'm old enough. Um, all right, so we're going to remember, no class till July 21st. The date is in the bulletin, but, you know, you can... Um, Pass it on to those that are... Yeah, friends. so... And I'll, I'll try to announce that on Sunday, too, so that everybody hears it. And, but, you know, you know some of the other people that are usually here. Just tell them that we got a month off, basically. All right, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your power, for your power to heal, your power not just to heal physical ailments, by the way, but the mistakes we make in life. Please guide us and lead us so that more and more and more we don't react impulsively, but instead ponder your will and follow you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.